Hi, this is Alex, and if you love music, you've come to the right place because we're all about albums. There are many albums that have come out in both mono and stereo recordings. When you are record shopping and looking to purchase an album that comes in both the mono and stereo version, which one do you buy? Which one's better? Which one sounds better? Which one's more valuable? Well, we're going to get to many of these questions and hopefully we'll have some answers, but it's not so straightforward as you'll see. Before we discuss the merits of a stereo or a mono recorded album, first we have to understand what stereo and mono is. A mono recording consists of having one microphone. This microphone will then record one audio channel. So you can play this back with one speaker. With a stereo system having two speakers, what happens is the single audio channel is duplicated and the same music comes out of each speaker. If the sound is hitting you at the same time from each speaker, you're going to get a very focused central image. However, where the musicians are placed within the sound stage will be difficult to ascertain with monophonic recordings. In stereophonic recordings, two or more microphones are used. With two or more microphones, you'll then have information that will have audio signal from the left channel and a separate audio channel from the right, since stereo gives us a more accurate re representation of what the musical event actually was, we can also get an idea of where the musicians are placed, both how close they are and how far they are. So we have a better understanding of the depth of the recording, which is not available with monophonic recordings. So we have a more 3D effect with stereophonic recordings. You can produce then a central image which features either a soloist or a vocalist or other uh, musician or sound that you want to accentuate. If the sound from the right and left speaker reaches your ears at the same time, the brain perceives this as an image directly in front of you. So simplistically, a stereophonic recording has not only height and width, but also has depth. Whereas in monophonic recordings, it only has height and width, so you get a 2D effect. How can you use this information today? Well, as I said, with stereo recordings, there is music information in the right and left channel, which are different. So if you would be wearing earbuds and only want to use one of the earbuds, what would happen? Part of the information of the music would be gone and you would not be getting the uh, entire uh, song. So how can you do that and still with one earbud get all the music? Well you would change it to mono because as we said, mono recordings have all the information which is the same in the right and the left channel. So by listening in mono with one earbud, you would get the entire song. Also, if you wanted to share an earbud with someone who wants to listen to a song, also by changing it to mono, each of you would hear the exact same musical information. So the way to do that, you would go to settings and under the general settings, you would go to accessibility and hearing and under hearing, you would change it to mono mode. An example of the differences of mono and stereo recordings can be found in the catalog of the Beatles. The Beatles were really only interested in the mono mixes and they spent a lot of time getting the sound just right. This mono mix is how the albums of the Beatles sounded originally on the radio. So to create the stereo sound, what had to happen was since the recording was in mono, the engineer had to take all the layers of the mono mix, separate them and lay them out. Once they lay them out, they would assign certain portions of the mix into the left channel and certain portions of the mix into the right channel. And therefore you would create this stereotype sound. So this is not really true stereo sound. This is actually what they call rechanneled stereo. So here we have Rubber Soul. This is a monophonic recording of Rubber Soul. We have the exact same album cover, and this is a stereophonic recording. How do you know? Well, you have to flip the album over, and this one here you see says mono, and this one here says stereo. So you have to do a little bit of investigation on the album itself. Now on the album Revolver, it's uh, on the front uh, cover, it says mono here, and you have the exact same cover here, and here it says uh, stereo. So you can tell which one is which. If you're only gonna buy one Beatle album, I would recommend buying the monophonic recording, as I said prior. The recordings that occurred before 1959, or more accurately, likely 1957, they were all 
mono recordings. So therefore, if you're looking for an album that is from the 40s, 50s, these are going to be typically monophonic recordings. So therefore, you're not going to get true stereo. However, there was two labels that did have some stereophonic uh, recordings during the 1950s. Both Atlantic and RCA purchased uh, stereo recording equipment. This allowed them to record in stereo, even though the records were released originally in mono. However, because they had stereophonic recordings, they can go back into their older catalogs and give you true stereo uh, recordings. The Atlantic label has stereophonic recordings back to 1952, and RCA has stereophonic recordings going back to 1954. When many record buyers wanted stereo recordings, what were the record labels other than Atlantic and RCA going to do with their 1950s catalog? Well, they can simply release them in the mono format because they can play mono records on a stereophonic record system. However, they can also what's called re-channeling into stereo. What they would do is they would split the signal into two audio signals from the mono recording, and then they would add a slight delay to one of the channels as well as some reverb, and this caused a sort of pseudo stereo sound. Now, it can be difficult when you look at records to determine which is which because they were not always very clear. Most of the time when they said stereo, it really meant rechanneled stereo. Here are some examples. This is a Columbia recording, and this is a stereo 360 sound. So this is a true stereo reproduction. Here you can see on this label that it is actually said it's rechanneled stereo. Many people didn't understand what rechanneled stereo meant either, but they saw the word stereo, so they said, aha, we're getting stereo, but now you know you're not getting true stereo. This is a trick that they're trying to make it sound like stereo, but it is really a mono recording. Here's another one that's even more difficult to understand. It says enhanced for stereo. What does that mean? Well, uh, most people think that this enhanced for stereo actually means rechanneled stereo. So again, this is probably a monophonic recording, which they enhanced to fool you into saying it's stereo um, just for you to buy it because that's what was in vogue. So in the 1960s, there were actually three options for stereo. First, you get true stereo sound. Second is you can get rechanneled stereo. And third, you can get some of the songs being true stereo recordings and others on the album being rechanneled stereo. Now, the labeling, as I have said, is not very accurate. So therefore, you didn't know a lot of times what you were truly getting. The very small record labels, they continued with monophonic recordings through the 1960s. Additionally, jazz labels typically recorded in the 1960s in mono, but not all albums were monophonic. So here are some numbers. In 1960, only one in approximately 50 albums released were true stereo recordings. By 1966, about half the recordings were true stereo. By 1967, stereophonic recordings were outselling monophonic recordings. And by 1968, most record labels were not producing monophonic recordings. So how do you choose what to buy? Well, the general rule, again, is before 1959 or 1957, whichever you choose, basically it's monophonic recordings. It's pretty simple. After 1970, almost everything is stereophonic recordings, so you didn't have to worry. So now we have to decide mono or stereo, which is better. And again, we're talking about the time period between 1959 or 1957 and 1970. This is the time period where both stereo and mono recordings were done. There are many arguments for buying the mono recording. Typically, the artists and the engineers would spend more time mixing the album in mono, and stereo was an afterthought, as we spoke about with the Beatles. So monophonic recordings here would be a better quality. In the early 1960s, although the album was recorded in stereo, it, however, would be uh, mixed more likely in mono to get the best sound. So if you play it back on a stereo system, the problem you are going to have is you're not going to have a proper sound stage. You may not have all the information as to the live event. Next, for you jazz fans, most of the music in jazz in the 50s and 60s was recorded in mono. So for collectors of jazz music, they would want the mono recordings because these would be the most accurate. 
also albums in the 1960s, as we said, many of the stereo albums were actually rechanneled stereo, so it's not true stereo. So when a important anniversary date uh, comes up, the label may re-release uh, an important album, and again, it would be released in the stereo or rechanneled version and not the mono version. So for a collector, again, the mono version would be rarer and more valuable. AM radio stations carried mono recordings out into approximately 1973. So for those of you who listened to AM radio in the 1960s and early 70s, this sound of the mono recording would be more familiar to you. And finally, when albums are re-released and reissued for a special uh, event, such as an anniversary edition, the stereotapes would be uh, taken out and that's what would be used to redo the album. Because the stereotapes would have been handled many times over, the sound quality from the stereotapes may have been degraded. The monotapes, however, would be handled less and therefore actually mono uh, recordings would be probably at a higher quality. Obviously, there's always an exception and the exception is the following. For collectors, stereo recordings of the late 1950s would be preferred. Why is that? Because almost all the recordings were released in mono. So if a stereo version was released, it would be considered a rare album. So for collectors then, for this reason only, stereo would be uh, preferred just due to its value. In my view, pretty much you would want the mono recording for almost any album that was released during this time period for the reasons we talked about above. However, as I said, collectors are different. If you're a collector, more likely than not, you're gonna buy both recordings because that's what a collector does. They wanna have a complete discography of the artist, which means having both the stereo and the mono versions of the same album. I don't think you should buy rechanneled stereo. This is pseudo stereo, and therefore uh, it's just a trick uh, to fool you into hearing what you think is stereo, which is really a monophonic recording to start with. For those of you who want to play mono albums and get the most enjoyment of a mono album, you would need to have a mono cartridge. This would give you the best reproduction of the mono recording. Now, a stereo uh, compatible phono cartridge is back compatible with mono album, so you don't have to worry about that. However, the reverse is not true. You do not want to use a mono uh, phono cartridge with a stereo album. You can damage the cartridge and the album that way. Before we get to last video's unknown albums, I wanted to see if you actually got the clue that I gave. Uh, obviously it was a silent clue and that's what these albums were all about. The first unknown album is Simon and Garfunkel's The Sounds of Silence. There's that silence again. Now uh, this album was released in January of 1966. It reached number 22 in the album charts in the States but went higher and reached number 13 in the UK. Uh, this album not only had the hit song Sounds of Silence, which was a number one song in January of 1966. It also had other hit songs, including their big hit, I Am A Rock. Interestingly, the uh, song which became the hit, The Sounds of Silence, first appeared on their first studio album. The first studio album is called Wednesday Morning, 3 a.m. Now, this is sort of an interesting story. In 1964, the album was first released on the Columbia label. And um, it really didn't do well. And actually, uh, both Simon and Garfunkel uh, broke up at this point. And uh, Paul Simon went off to England. And there he did a solo project where he did record an album that was only released in the United Kingdom. So during the time that Paul Simon was in England, things were happening in the States for the song The Sounds of Silence. DJs in the state of Florida, as well as the Boston area, were playing the song, and the song was catching on. However, this song was different on both albums. On the original version of the song, The Sounds of Silence, is an all-acoustic version. Tom Wilson, a producer of Columbia Records, found out that the song was getting some airplay. So to try to make this a hit record, he decided to overdub 
the song and used some studio musicians. He laid down a rhythm section with both a bass, an electric guitar, and drums. This is a song we know today, and it climbed the charts and did reach number one, as I said, in January of 1966. When Paul Simon found out about this, he returned to the States, and both he and Art Garfunkel reunited, and they went back into the studio and released the album we know today. So, if it wasn't for the uh, sharp ears of the Columbia producer Tom Wilson, Simon and Garfunkel may have been silent. Our second unknown album is in a silent way. Again, we have the word silent in the title. Now, this album is by Miles Davis. It was released in 1969. This is an extremely important jazz album. This album pushed the boundaries of jazz. This is a fusion album, and what fusion is, is the melding of two genres. In this case, the genres were jazz music and rock music. What happened was Miles Davis's girlfriend introduced him to the Jimi Hendrix Experience and Sly Stone. This music did influence Miles Davis and gave him some new creative ideas. With these ideas, he brought on some uh, young, talented musicians. Uh, he brought on uh, John McLaughlin on guitar. He brought on Dave Holland on bass. And finally, on uh, keyboards, he brought on Chick Corea. Chick Corea recently passed away. So he is considered one of the godfathers, so to speak, of uh, jazz fusion. And um, he would later go on to win multiple Grammy Awards as a, a keyboardist in both jazz, in fusion, and in some classical music as well. Uh, Chick Corea went on to win 23 Grammy Awards, which is quite a few and um, he is actually nominated for two more Grammy Awards. This album did uh, manage to ruffle a lot of feathers. People who love traditional jazz were kind of uh, upset about what Miles was doing, but Miles Davis, he uh, wanted to push the envelope forward. He thought music should have a futuristic forward view. An interesting tidbit about this album, this was done in a single recording in approximately three hours time, which is again remarkable, but not atypical for jazz, which liked to be spontaneous. Herbie Hancock was quoted saying about this album that Miles Davis wanted to be risk-taking and wanted to capture the moment, which is what he did. Herbie Hancock also did play on this album. And now this video's first unknown album. Okay, hope you got that one. And here is this video's second unknown album. Okay, well, as always, I will reveal the answers on the next video. So if you don't want to miss the next video, uh, please subscribe. Also, uh, if you think you know the answers to this week's unknown uh, uh, album, please uh, leave uh, your answers in the comments below and I will let you know if you got them right. As always, this is Alex with All About Albums. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. And remember, keep them spinning.